nice to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you all for spending Tuesday night with us. Um, and just to honor, I mean, this whole you know, reality check, the reward project that has developed since February has been really kind of indirectly a meta project too, uh, as far as me as an artist and as far as being a person of color, going into another community, coming from a community that has been gentrified and going into another community that is fighting that challenge as well. So just to acknowledge that it's not just me you're seeing up here, Everybody that's in the room that I've had a conversation with regarding this project, can you stand up and be acknowledged as well? There's several of you here. Yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, Roberto, you're one of them too. <laughs> and Sixto is one of them too. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's important to realize that I'm not here as Sarah. I'm here as a, coll a collaborative project that involves different people from the community and I wouldn't be up here without them, so I appreciate all of you. Um, and I want to remind myself, as well as all of us here in the audience, what my initial um, guiding questions were for this project, because so much has come out of it, and it stemmed out of my experience that I had um, with Santana's Fairy Tales, which started out in my hometown as an ethno ethnographic research literary arts project. Um, so the guiding questions, <laughs> are, can conceptual black indigenous people of color art be dri driven force in combating displacement gentrification across urban communities? And can the retelling of history and the future from a black indigenous people of color point of view reclaim and reinstate historical context, current social justice narratives, and storytelling in urban neighborhoods? and even go as far as provide more access to relevant research in and out of academia. So those questions have obviously developed and stretched out a little bit since I first started, but I think what's um, most important for me to start is that along the research, I, you know, one of the things that I felt was very important from the beginning was to learn the history first. Um, and I learned that from my own hometown because when I started Santana's Fairy Tales, um, I really had no idea of how much of the history was missing on the media headlines and, and the, in the history books and schools, or even in urban legends, right? Like how, how many things get changed from one you know, point of view or from chisme from one person to the other. Um, and so when I first arrived um, to Third Ward as part of the fellowship, I picked up um, several books, and one was Racism Takes Place by George Lipsis, and my first night in a, in a contemporary shotgun house, I read that chapter, and I did have one of those moments where like, I'm reading this chapter inside a shotgun house, and you know, and I feel like there's spirits talking to me, <laughs> because it just echoed a lot of history that I had no idea existed before. And so along those lines, I reached out to several folks, several of you here in the audience, and got more um, references to books. Houston Bound was one that I acquired by um, someone, you know, professor here on campus, and, and I thought that was the, one of the strongest books for this project. And uh, another book that I've been using just to tie this inter in an intersectional manner, because one, another thing that was important is to ask who gets to tell these stories, right? I'm coming into Third Ward. I am not part of the community. It's a predominantly historically black community, so I'm not here to retell black stories. Um, but I do think it's important to talk about how our histories do intersect. And again, going back to the idea of uh, if we would know each other's histories, maybe there's a way to prevent some of the situations that repeat cycle after cycle. Um, and so I went ahead and started reading um, the African American and Latinx history um, of the U.S. by Paul Ortiz because that gave a, a general national point of view. Um, and then you know I visited different museums along with Project Row Houses, but you know the Buffalo Soldiers Museum, and there was just so much history there that, again that we don't experience in our history books or in day-to-day -day life outside of Houston. <laughs> So, um, coming from the West Coast, that you know, there's a lot of history about Houston and specifically Third Ward that I learned in this process. Um, 
And then taking it further and being even more specific by buying a book that's, you know, um, black women in Texas, um, Asian Americans in Texas. Um, and, you know, really getting to know that it's not just one story that tells all this whole area, right? There's different intersections and, um, and that was really important to me as well. So then I thought, again, this is all academics and there's a lot of privilege involved with being able to buy all these books. Um, and at the same time, some, a lot of them, not some of them, a lot of them were not in easy to handle language. So I was literally just sifting through pages and tagging, not necessarily reading from cover to cover. Um, and I was cheating and using indexes. Um, but then I thought, how, how do we translate this to the, to the general public, right? Um, and with Santana's fairy tales, I had used fairy tales. So with um, Reality Check Third Ward, I also wanted to focus um, on happier endings because I think often we are, as people of color, we hear a lot of sad, sad endings and a lot of trauma. And we have very few moments where we celebrate together as a community. Um, and I think, you know, how do we change the storyline so that we do create some type of celebratory, um, you know, moments. So, moving forward with the project, I was able to establish um, a focus. So, Reality Check the Award is a collaborative multimedia ethnofiction project addressing gentrification and the need for representation -repre of black indigenous people of color history. With the prediction of a people of color majority by 2030, third ward and cities across the nation continue to fight against the displacement of historically black indigenous people of color communities. Underserved localities are overrun by urban developers and newcomers who pose a threat to longtime residents, rep representing the resilience of the region. The project incorporates the digital humanities to chronicle the past, present, and future via audio, video, documentation, and a, and a futuristic joy time capsule produced in collaboration with residents around the third ward, Houston, Texas. So let's, when I was reading all these books and I was just like flagging important moments, um, I, I was also learning about a lot of people um, and one person in particular, which, you know, the goal is, when this is a finished project, Pat Parker will be um, echoed throughout the, the book, um, but that's what the first quote on the cover is. I am a child of America, a stepchild raised in the back room. Now, and that quote stood out to me because, again, I felt like this was a very meta project because I was born in the United States. My family came from Matamoros, Tamaulipas. I'm the first one born on both sides, yet I have never felt fully accepted in this country. And I'm very, you know, uh, articulate, a great English speaker now, even though Spanish was my first language, and I still can't find a way to gain acceptance in this nation. Right? I'm still asked at the age of 45, where did I come from? And I think about these questions daily and, and, and when experiencing those ideas through other um, communities' eyes, right? So, um, and then you, you, you're looking at this image, it's actually the backyard of where I stayed. I stayed in that house most of the time, um, which is one of the contemporary shotgun houses that was built by Rice, right, Cindy? Yeah. Um, and so that was the view I had most of my visits. And, um, but I was thinking like, how can we gain a broader audience for our history? And I thought, well, everybody's into graphic novels, everybody's into art, right? So let's turn reality into an art. And not in the sense of art is a, you know, um, a reflection of, of life or a depiction of life, but more of like, no, there's a lot of truths behind this, this illustration that go unseen because you wouldn't look at it if it was an ordinary picture, right? Um, oh, we need to refresh this. How do I refresh it? Um, so going forward, the date that I decided was important to start on was 1844. And when I started to um, interview folks in the community, and I spoke to a broad number of folks, and they can be referred by 
different people at various times. Um, you know, this is one of the starting points that really I got a lot of pushback from. But to me, as a storyteller, it felt important because um, the fact that in 1844, the Jewish community came to Third Ward and bought four acres of land, not to build a temple, but to establish a cemetery, again, goes back to how many people that face oppression start with trauma versus, you know, affirmations of possible joy, right? Um, and so what I started doing is learning these histories and collecting photos, photos from Wikipedia, photos from the books, but then also traveling to those sites and collecting my own photos as documentation. And as the project you know, um, continued, I started um, thinking of different ways to navigate space, not just in third court, but in academia, because often as artists we get um, put on as entertainment, not necessarily as scholars or historians or archivists. Um, people forget that we have degrees, um, and or some of us, some of us don't need them. And and so one of the things that I started looking at this documentation as footnotes in art. And I get asked often about how do I go about collecting research and documenting it in my stories, and I'm like, that's not important to me. Um, but then I realized that it is important because oftentimes people, as people of color, they don't believe us unless we have sources, unless we have someone to say we are right or yes, we can do it. Um, and so I started with Jewish and Third Ward, and this is a picture of the cemetery that I took um, when I was on a tour with Bernard Hobson, who did um, a tour of the 19, um, please correct my dates if, if, if I have this wrong, 1917 uprising, is that correct? Uh, the battalion, the, um, and and I was on that tour again to gain information, but I had no idea I was going to pass the cemetery that day, and you know the uprisings passed through the cemetery, you know area, so that's why I ended up there. Now another part of the project again, when we talk about history, and often the the words that are coded in U.S. history, right? Manifest destiny. I thought, wow, their history sounds so joyful. Yet our history, our uprisings, protests, police brutality, deaths, um, and I was also thinking of like, how do we translate our history in these through words, right? So in the timeline, whenever I'm referring to U.S. white history, it stays in black and white, um, whereas. People of color, as, as much as I can do and document in color, I do, but then when I take archives, I may not have a choice because there was only black and white photos. Um, so this is the idea of, of countering manifest destiny was the second point that came into the research. And then, you know, continuing to collect research specifically to Third War, so that is the the main line into this history. Eventually, this timeline will include Asian American history in Houston, as well as Latinx and queer history. Um, but for the for the final lecture, I wanted to focus on the idea of the, the, the history in Third Ward. Um, but I also wanted to share that uh, a lot of this would have never happened with the multiple conversations that I had, um, as well as the collaborations. Um, and so, reaching out to folks in the community, I also had to think who, who would be good sources for advisement and referrals. And um, luckily, I was introduced to Roberto Tejada. I was also, um, I already had known um, uh, Dr. Um, Gabriela uh, Ventura Vanessa um, at Arte Publico, but I wasn't familiar with the use of technology to this extent. I have done digital archives in the past. They are pretty much PDFs in the PowerPoint presentation uploaded. Um, so now I'm working with this timeline. And so this kind of echoed the idea of like, how do we create information that's easily accessible, translatable, and engaging, right? Not just with people in the classroom, but from anywhere. And with youth particularly, right? So graphic novels are a big thing right now. Um, so this timeline is by Night Lab. And if you don't know Night Lab, you should, it's free. Um, and if you're a student in the class and you really want to impress your teacher, create a timeline in Night Lab. Um, it's really easy. If you can use Google Docs Excel, you can create this timeline. 
Um, and so that's, luckily, I thought that was going to be lots and lots of training, so I had scheduled days to meet with Gabby at her office, and she kept saying, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. I'm like, no, I'm 45, I can't use technology like this. Um, and, you know, we're from the same generation, more or less. Um, so when I went in one day ready to, like, take hours of training, I learned how to use it within an hour. And I was finishing a sample of a timeline by the end of the day. Um, so again, I always tell folks, if I can do it and I went to school before the internet, you all can do it too. <laughs> Here's Pat Parker. And what's symbolic about Pat Parker, and I had a long conversation with Rachel, um, you know, about this because so many people, I thought like, wow, how do I not know about Pat Parker? And then I would mention them, mention her to people and they didn't know about Pat Parker either. And I said, how, how do people in third war not still, you know, some folks still don't know about Pat Parker? Um, especially when now Solange is singing her, her, her stanzas. Um, so Pat Parker was actually Pat, uh, Patricia Cooks, and Parker's just one of her married names, but she kept it. And um, what I found interesting is that she was born in third ward, and we're talking about displacement and gentrification, she got really ill as a child, like in her first few years of life, and she had to be hospitalized, and her parents were working class. Um, dad owned some kind of um, mechanic shop, I mean, that was all, even though he was a business owner, he basically had to cash out his job to pay for the medical bills, and they moved to Sunnyside after that. Um, so again, we're talking about how people get pushed away based on life constraints, and not just development, but the idea of like, you can't afford to maintain your business because it's, it's you have to pay for your child's health, right? Um, and Pat Parker left Houston as fast as she could. She left when she was 17 um, because she was queer and at the time didn't understand how to articulate that. Um, she went to the Bay Area and we, you know, I, there's a lot of history of folks from Houston fleeing to the Bay Area. Um, and Carl Hampton is one. Um, and she never came back. And I thought that was a great loss to our community. And even now, her archives, her work isn't even archived here, which I think, again, that continues to speak how even in our own communities, we're not appreciated as artists or acknowledged. And I think, um, that's why she was really important when I kept reading history to echo, again, her poetry. And this book is amazing. If you read it cover to cover, this is the only book out of the, I don't know, 20 books that I bought that I read cover to cover. Um, and I highly recommend it. And so with the project, I, I will continue to make recommendations of what got me to this point, and Pat Parker will be echoed on almost every page. Now, this was my first artist crush when I got to third ward. <laughs> when I found out who John Biggers was, I couldn't imagine a life not knowing who he was. Um, he was doing Afrofuturism before it was even a term. And not only that, it's a huge inspiration to Rick Lowe for Project Royal Houses, and he continues to um, inspire many, you know. And so I think just knowing who he was and the presence he has in third ward and at Texas Southern University, which I did, you know, um, I did get to get a tour of the murals there, and I thought, if you, if I, you know, every time I got into a lift in Houston during this year, I would talk to, you know, my my whole lift ride and tell the guy, the guy or the woman, whoever was driving, like, have you been to TSU? And they're like, no, or yes, and then I asked them about the murals, and no one ever knew about the murals, like no one ever knows about Pat Parker. Um, so if you haven't been to TSU, go check out the murals. Um, John Bigger started the tradition that every new cohort gets to paint murals on the walls, and they're still up, so you can trace history on the walls from his time to present. And now we're here talking about population. In 1950, 70% of blacks in Houston lived in Third Ward, right? Um, and the reason why this is important, oops, um, if that's 1950, and then you have the next date is May 17, 1954, segre you know, this desegregation of schools or integration. Again, we're talking about difference of words, and to me what was really important 
was recognizing not just the difference in words that I was familiar with, but also, you know, how, again, how they make it sound better. And I always thought integration sounds so much nicer than desegregation, because it's almost like you're hiding the real reason why you have to integrate, right? Um, and so to me, that stood out. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I want to point out um, with this project and the use of words is how do I get to learn all this traumatic history and, and talk about it in a joyful way in the future, right? So one of the quotes that I took with me from the plenty of books that I read, and I keep saying I read 10, I'm reading 10,000 pages to read 100, um, is the quote by Lorraine Hansberry. The unmistakable roots of the universal solidarity of the colored peoples of the world are no longer, no longer predictable as they were in my father's time. They are here. So, I don't know if you all know this, but under the, um, under the current administration, there's been a rise of white supremacy and it has gained more visibility. Um, you know, it's, it's as, to me, it's, a, it's <laughs> we can all laugh, hopefully. Um, some of us still cringe. Um, it's almost like our future looks too much like our past right now. Um, so for me, it was really important to capture like how can we change the future? Um, and one of the ways that I'm doing it is to reclaim words, right? So uh, taking into consideration data like the dates, um, the people who've created the history, Carl Hampton was another um, person I had no idea of until I started reading. And if you don't know about Carl Hampton, just Google him um, and then read a book about him too. So there's a whole other project, which I don't know if it exists yet, but I plan to look, look research is how black men from that era were killed by FBI across the nation. Um, and there's just too many of them that go unacknowledged. So that leads me to Project Row Houses. That's one of the houses that Project Row House um, bought in from Fourth Ward and brought it over and preserved it. Um, that was in my backyard. That's now where All Real Radio um, does their global um, radio station. And one of the reasons that's important about Project Row House being on this timeline is because it starts to show how the present is taking shape based on the initiatives that they push through, right? So we, here we have January 20th, 2016. I, uh, people always get that date confused and like, why did you put that specific date? And then they think about it and they're like, oh, I get it now. Mm -hmm. So that brings it forward to the present. Like, how did I take this information and collaborate with folks? It was, it, I can't say it was something that happened naturally. Um, it took a lot of conversations, as you saw. Um, but I had no idea that All Real Radio was in my backyard. Um, and one of my friends in the, in the writer's community said, I know somebody that does work in Third Ward. Let me introduce you. We started chatting via Facebook, and then she tells me where All Real Radio is, and I'm like, I'm in your backyard, um, literally. And so that's how I ended up working with Denise Lopez um, and, you know, and um, Drew Evans, who are uh, running All Real Radio. If you don't know who All Real Radio is, download their app, listen, listen to music and conversations 24-7. Um, and Denise Lopez is a Chicana indigenous woman um, who has long ties to the community, as well as um, you know different folks in the Latinx community. And Drew Evans has a long history as well. Um, you know, he, his family had, was displaced through trauma as well. Um, and he has shared that in an interview with me. And, um, and now he's back in Third Ward and has been here with his own family for, I think, 15 years now. Um, so out of the outcome of the project so far includes um, a collaboration with Aria Radio in Third Ward and at the Publico Press. Um, through the recovery project. So learning, taking um, notes and learning hands-on through Gabi of how to you know, transfer all this information into a digital platform. So not just dealing with my lab, which again is a free resource to everybody, but I've also um, been learning how to use Scalar. Um, and that's another open source um, platform that you can use to publish work. Now, what's interesting to me, it's based out of USC and it's free. Um, 
and it was started by artists, but it's mostly academics that are using it. Um, so now I'm telling everybody that there, there's a different way to put information out um, and make it accessible. And my lab timeline can easily be embedded into a Scalar um, platform. And Scalar is S-C-A-L-A-R. So, why it's minoritized? Um, playing on words again because they predict that in 2030, uh, Houston will be a majority majority, right? So in other words, people of color will be the majority, not just population-wise because it already is, it's one of the top three um, um, POC um, cities, but also civically and economically. So what happens in 2030? This is where it got to be a lot more engaging for me because I got to make up stuff, um, but highly influenced by facts. Uh, so. I got to define this term. So whites minoritized means to make white people the minority was coined in 2030 after Houston became a people of color majority and population, civic leaders, and business capital. A slang term used by the minoritized is post-Trump era. So one of the things when we're talking about creating something sci-fi, most people associate it with um, dystopia or trauma and I was like what what is that like why why are we predicting our own deaths let's predict our own future and where we thrive not just survive right now we're not where we're just fighting for survival um, so during the one-year fellowship uh, I've also been developing the concept of futuristic joy as a way to rewrite and reconstitute Houston's and third words history and future um, so I researched Third Ward's history through various publications and archives, conducted in-person meetings with black, indigenous, POC community leaders, and connected the information to cyclical historical accounts of racism and eminent domain against property owned by black folks and people of color surrounding Third Ward. So one goal of the project is to present this narrative through a collaborative multimedia ethnofiction approach. So using facts to write fiction. Similar to my work with Santana's fairy tales, I'm creating a third ward historical and virtual timeline to integrate contemporary topics, acts of gentrification, displacement in third ward and surrounding areas. I'm, I also took um, audio and video recordings of local residents enhanced by graphic illustration app and eventually publishing a graphic novel that showcases all forms of history through augmented reality and cited works through an online platform like Scalar. Um, and so, so the idea of futuristic joy comes from, you know, what would be the best medium to present a relevant science fiction narrative countering the traditional dystopia format with what I'm defining as futuristic joy. Um, so one of my interviewees is, was Michelle Barnes. She was also one of my mentors. And I can say that proudly because as a 45-year-old Latina, I've had very little mentors that I can relate or that I claim as mentors, right? And um, because I've never really had full-on professors of color um, that taken, you know, the lead into my education or my career. Um, and with this project, I've been very fortunate to have, you know, Gabby and Michelle um, as women of color along my side and supporting me. So. This is, has to be one of the, by far my favorite definitions of futuristic joy. Um, and with the interviews, I interviewed people, I'm gonna need your help to try to push. <laughs> so keep coming. Um, I interviewed people, but I try to be consistent in giving them full claim. Um, so I, the questions were very simple. What POC or any identity that you, that you wanna claim, history do you think is important? And I didn't have to ask much more because people are willing and waiting to share their history and their narratives. And then from there I would ask, um, okay, thinking about futuristic joy, and a lot of people had a hard time thinking about that as joy. Um, you know, how would you describe it? What do you want in the future? My reference point for futuristic joy is in the past. I remember growing up in third grade, this geographical neighborhood, and walking alone and with friends, riding the bus with my parents, riding the bicycle with my friends and family, going where I wanted to go, having no fear. That's what I want for the future. I want our neighborhoods to be beautiful, 
still dealing with the horrors of our past in some aspects, being brought here to this country as enslaved people in many cases, and being able to surmount those challenges, those difficulties. Growing up in uh, segregated schools, believing they are ready for the world confidently, is something that I hope will be in place and bring future wisdom. So in the 2030, majority, majority, whites become minoritized. My, I envision that in third ward, people are ecstatic and join together um, similar celebrations like Juneteenth, which becomes contagious and takes over all of Houston to the points where the headlines, the national headlines, are calling it at first in mocking, but then it becomes a term as Houston's futuristic, futuristic joy, right? Um, but like ethnic cleansing happens in one year when the whites run it, in one year's time, it becomes a national thing. So in, that, in one year's time, futuristic joy is every city in the United States. But not to villainize or criminalize white folks because we have learned that that doesn't help, right, in our community. Um, but again, to the idea of what would this nation look like if people of color ran it civically and economically. Um, and so moving forward, what happens uh, when you think of this, like one of the antonyms that I created for the few, you know, is, you know, or synonyms is POC equitized. Um, antonym, again, dystopia or post-Trump, or sorry, dystopia or Trump era. So the idea of let's counter these moments in our present time and retell our history so that we can reconstitute our future. so that we learn each other's histories. Um, because there is so much I already learned from black history in the last nine months that I wish I could have applied to the last 40 years of my life. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of privilege, again, that comes with being a fellow and having access to these resources, but a way to, you know, for me to be able to give back is to make them accessible. Um, and that, and acknowledge that all of the people in the community um, that have taken part in this in this collaboration. And then going forward, it's not me telling their stories, it's the community telling their stories. So it doesn't, you don't, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of if you have a degree or if you walk into the ivory tower, it's a matter that education and history starts in the community first. And goes, if, if academics are privileged enough to talk to folks in the community, then it goes to, academia, and then it goes back to the community. Um, so the reason for me footnotes and art became a thing was because I want to cite all the information I'm gathering from all the sources. Because people, you know, like Libby said, that there's so many people already doing the work, but when you start something, you have to start from the ground up because we're not having these conversations. So now it's like, well, if I tell you what book I got this information from or what website I have this information from, 
then it becomes accessible to everyone and we don't have to stand from, start from the ground up when it comes to history. We can intersect it. Because there wasn't one book in the past that I could read African American, Asian American, and Chicanx or Latinx history um, until I picked up Paul Ortiz's book and that still didn't have Asian or Middle Eastern um, history. So these conversations are important as well as these making it all accessible. Moving forward, what do I do now? Because part of this process is me as an artist of color being 45 years old. I don't really have a home. I'm back in my hometown because I had an artist in residence. But, you know, I have, I don't know where, I, I didn't know until last week where I was going to live come January. Um, and again, I have to move out of my city to be able to stay by, nearby. Like, at this time, I don't have to move that far. I'm only six miles out of Santa Ana. Um, but I was telling you six so today that the way that this project has helped um, is changing my perspective and also telling people that it's important that we recollect and represent and preserve our own histories, right? And so um, I'm happy to announce that next semester I get to teach a course at Chapman University based on this methodology and teach um, undergrad students how to apply um, the digital humanities, collecting and recollecting and, and preserving history focused solely on black indigenous POC history as well as um, women and queer history from 1960s to present time. Um, so I'm really excited because it's a pilot course and we'll see how all this continues to apply and create more intersectionality. Thank you. Mm -hmm.